we thank you that many of us have experienced that salvation and the promises of what it means to follow you. God, we thank you for that. God, my prayer today for us is, Lord, that you would help us to see the many blessings we have, but we would see that they have a purpose. And so, God, I pray that in our hearts that you would open our eyes to what you've blessed us with and you would open our eyes to the purpose. God, that you would convict us of areas where we are not living with purpose and intentionality. God, that you would give us the courage to take steps to follow you more completely. God, that you would help us to fall more in love with you today so that your purpose and your mission and you captivate our lives so that we will give, give of our many blessings so that others might know you. God, will we be a people and a church that live out Psalm 67? A blessed people that are blessed for a purpose. God, would you let that drive our lives? God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So our first point is simple, it's straightforward, but it is foundational for understanding this psalm and understanding our lives. And our first point is simply this, all blessings come from God. We see that in verse 1, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. The psalmist here acknowledges that it is God who blesses. He doesn't say may our hard work pay off in blessing our nation. He doesn't say may the leaders in our government figure out their acts so the nation is blessed by their policy. He doesn't say may the rain gods pour down extra rain upon us, but he says may God be gracious and bless us. All the blessings we have come from God. And friends, we are an abundantly blessed people. I mean, just the fact that we are sitting here in a church building with no threat of being shut down or government oppression makes us blessed. We are blessed that we have access to the Bible, that we have heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and many of us have experienced and surrendered to that salvation through Jesus. And if you're here today and you have never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do that today and experience His forgiveness. The good news is that Jesus died for you and He waits for you to repent and to turn to Him. And if you do that, He is faithful to forgive your sins. That's the greatest blessing you could ever possibly experience We are a blessed people because we have access to Jesus and his blessing of forgiveness. And so you might say, are we just talking about spiritual blessings? Are we talking about physical blessings in this psalm as well? Well, as you read the text, I believe we're absolutely talking about spiritual blessings, that we are blessed to have the gospel and to be forgiven. But it's also talking about physical blessings. Verse 6 says, the land yields its harvest. God our God blesses us. This increase on earth clues us into the fact that the psalmist is talking about the physical blessings as well as the spiritual. All that we have is a blessing from God. We talked about it last week, but even the skill set that we have been given and the job we have is a blessing, a gift from God. And We are a blessed people. We live in the, the wealthiest nation the world has ever known with comfort beyond the imagination of most of the known world. We've seen that a bit on display this week, haven't we, on our TVs. The images of our TV screen have been men, women, and children so desperate to leave their reality and come to our nation that they are flooding the streets of Afghanistan. The airport in Kabul, and some are so desperate they are hanging on to landing gear of planes in hopes that they might make it out and make it to America. Our nation has its problems, but we are a blessed people to live here, to experience the freedoms we have, to have heard the gospel and to have the wealth we have. And I don't say that to make us feel guilty, but it's the reality. We are a blessed people, and those blessings flow through God and His grace to us. In fact, I would say guilt is not at all the proper response to that reality, but instead, our response should be gratitude to all that God has blessed us with. We are a blessed people. We don't need to feel guilty about that or downplay that, but instead, we need to recognize that our blessings, the psalmist tells us, comes with a purpose and a responsibility. We see that in verse 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. The two most important words in this psalm are the first two words of verse 2. We have been abundantly blessed. God has shown his face to us. He has been gracious to us. And then here are the two words, so that. We have been blessed so that. There's a purpose behind God's blessing. God blesses his people so that something else might happen. And that's what we see in verse 2. So that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. That's our next point. We are blessed so that God's salvation may be known among the nations. We are blessed 
We are blessed so that God's salvation may be known in Green River, in Sweetwater County, in Wyoming, in the nations, in Afghanistan, in London, in India, in China, in Iraq, in Somalia, in Colombia. We are blessed so that the peoples of this world might know Jesus and his salvation. Verse 5, may the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. God blesses his people so that the peoples of the world might know him. His salvation, and so they might praise him. This word peoples refers to tribes, clans, and ethnic groups of the world. Scholars estimate that there are somewhere between 11,000 and 16,000 distinct people groups in the world, of which thousands have never heard the gospel in their native language. The psalmist knows that God blesses his people for a reason, and that reason is so that all of these people might hear the gospel, so they might experience God's salvation and praise him. From the north to the south, from the east to the west, from the rich to the poor, young to the old, urban to the rural, every tribe, every language, every ethnic group, to the ends of the earth, may they all praise you. This is not just a unique principle to Psalm 67. This has been God's pattern throughout the whole of Scripture and the whole of humanity. If you go back to Genesis 12, Genesis 12, God chooses Abram to be the father of his people, and this is what he says to him. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There was nothing special about Abram, but God chose him to be his own, and he blessed him so that he will be his conduit to proclaim his name, his salvation to the world. God says, I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. God from the beginning has been a God of the nations who desire to be known and to be praised by all of the families on earth. Abram was blessed to be a blessing to those around him. In Genesis 26, he makes the same promise to Abram's son Isaac. And then in Genesis 28, he makes the same promise to Abram's grandson Jacob. I have chosen you, I have blessed you so that you will be a blessing to the nations. In Exodus 14, the Israelites, they leave Egypt in dramatic fashion. And God says, it's so that the Egyptians might know that I am Lord. Deuteronomy 4, God gives the Israelites the commandments. He says, it's so that they will show his goodness to the nations. Joshua 5 and 6, God takes down the city of Jericho with the Israelite marching band. And he says, it's so that the people will know that he alone is Lord. We see it on display in Daniel when the Israelites are exiled in Babylon. God rescues his people, and pagan, non-believing kings bow down and declare him as Lord. We saw it in our series in Psalm 23. God leads us for what reason? He leads us for his name's sake, so that we might declare his name, his salvation to those around us. We see it in Isaiah, we see it in Ezekiel, we see it in Esther. Again and again, place after place, God blesses his people so that they will proclaim his name to the nations, to those around them. But it's not just an Old Testament principle or theme. We see it expanded in the New Testament. Jesus comes, God in flesh, and he preaches salvation. And then he gives his life for the salvation of every person on earth that would repent and trust in him. John 3.16 says he dies not just for the Jews. He dies not just for the Americans, but he dies for the world. And then the final thing Jesus says before he ascends to heaven is, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Mark 16, 15, he says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Similarly, Luke 24, 47 through 49, teaches us that Jesus died on the cross so that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be preached to all nations. Luke picks up the story in Acts 1, 8, and he says, you will receive my power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. That's what we see happen in the rest of the New Testament. We see this theme in, in Paul's life. And then last, we are left with this incredible promise in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. The promise that we are called to join. John writes, after this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. God is a God of all people. He's a God of the nations. And he will one day, Revelation promises, he will one day save men and women from every tribe, people, and tongues. And he has blessed us so that we will be the bearers of that good news to the world. 
God blesses his people so that they might proclaim his name, his good news, his salvation to their neighbors, to their friends, to their co-workers, and to the nations. God has blessed us not because we earned it or because we are special, but he has blessed us in his love for a purpose, which is to proclaim his name to the world. But there's a danger, a temptation that we are all prone to fall to. As those of us with great physical blessing and those of us that have been blessed with the gospel, those of us that have experienced salvation in Jesus, we are all prone to believe, to live our lives as though God's blessings are all about me. We are all prone to disconnect God's blessing in our lives from God's purpose and mission for our life. And that's our next point. We are all prone to disconnect God's blessings in our life from God's purpose for our life. Our world, our society, our culture, and many in the church tell us that this life is all about us and our comforts and our desires and living our best life. That's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us God has so much more for our lives. And we are blessed in so many ways, and God has blessed us not because there's something special about us or so that we can live in excessive, excessive comfort, but he has blessed us with the purpose of sharing our blessings and his salvation with those around us in the world. Now we are so blessed. Even on our worst days, we are blessed by where we live. I think back, I was 13 years old, and I had to have, because I had to have an emergency appendectomy. And because I was blessed to be born in America, something I didn't deserve, I had surgery, I missed two days of school, and I was good to go. If I'd lived in other places in the world, I very well could have died. This week, we had, we had a rough week of doctor's appointments. We found out we're going to have to change our diet to a much more restrictive diet because of the autoimmune disease that we're dealing with. It's going to be a pain. But we are so blessed because it is possible because we live in a country of incredible variety and options, and God has given us the financial resources to make the change. We got less than ideal news on Melody's cancer front, but because we live in America, there is treatment available that is inconvenient, but the prognosis is good. We are blessed even on the worst of days. And we're not blessed with medical care and longer lives just so we can comfortably enjoy our days until God calls us home. We are blessed that we can use these days to share Jesus with our neighbors and with the world. God has blessed us with life not to waste it, but to use it for his glory so that as many neighbors, friends, co-workers, unreached people groups might know Jesus and his hope and his salvation. Think about education in America. And we are blessed with an opportunity to get an education in this country. In so much of the world, education is for the wealthy, for the elite, and for men. In America, we have all had the opportunity to receive an education and advance ourselves and our families. Is it perfect? No. But it's an incredible opportunity that most of the world would give anything for. We are blessed with wealth. Most of us have never worried about whether or not we would have food to eat, a home to live in, and clothes to wear. We are a blessed people, and yet the temptation we are prone to is not to give thanks for our blessing and leverage them for God's kingdom, for our neighbors, for the world. But instead, our temptation is to look around and to try to keep up with the Joneses. We max out our abundant wealth because we worry that we don't have the newest vehicle, the nicest house, the newest toy, the same opportunity as someone else. We hamstring ourselves in debt so that we can barely pay our bills, nonetheless bless others or use our money for the glory of God. We worry that our children don't have all the opportunities, experiences, toys, comforts of their friends or of our childhood. We waste our lives chasing the comforts of the world and using our blessings for all our good, all while we watch our neighbors, friends, co-workers, and the world head, toward, head straight towards an eternity in hell. We spend all of our time making sure our children and our family have all the experiences and opportunities of this world, all while we create another generation focused solely on themselves and the experiences of the world. As opposed to fostering in them a love for God, a love for people, and the mission of God. Pastor David Platt said it like this. He said, the world says, when I make plans for my life and my career, I think just about what is best for me. I choose the house to live in, the car to drive, the clothes to wear, and the way to live that's best for me. He says, this version of Christianity prevails in our day, but it is incomplete. He continues, God glorifies himself by making his salvation known to us. God glorifies himself by saving you and me by the sacrifice of his son on a cross. He glorifies himself by showering us with his grace. And that grace has a goal and that goal is his glory. 
And he says, what made Psalm 67 such a life-altering text in my life is this. I realize that the blessings of God do not center on me. Instead, the blessings of God, the blessing of God is intended to spread through me. God has given me the gospel for a reason, and that reason is so that all peoples might know the gospel. God has given me gifts and talents for a reason, and that is to bless others. He says, God has given me wealth in this world for a purpose, and that purpose is not so that I can be more comfortable. Not so that I can have more luxuries, and not so that I can coast out my Christian life until I get to heaven. He says, no, that's not biblical Christianity. God has given me my wealth in this world for the spread of his worship in, the wor- in this world. All of his blessings ultimately center on him and not on me. My friends, there are an estimated 6,000 unreached people groups in the world, comp- comprising some 2 billion people that have never heard of a God that loves them and gave his life for them so, they could be, so that they could be forgiven and experience peace and salvation. In our community alone, the, the statistics say 95 plus percent of the population does not have a saving relationship with Jesus. That means if Green River was wiped out tomorrow, tomorrow, almost our entire community would spend eternity in hell separated from God. They've never experienced salvation. They've never experienced the gospel. They have no hope beyond this life. In missiologist terms, uh, an unreached people group is a distinct group, group of peoples in which less than 2% of the population has a, re- has a relationship with Jesus. Statistically, Green River is not far from that. We can't disconnect our blessing from our purpose. We have been blessed. We have been placed where we are in the community we are in, in the jobs we are in, so that Green River, so that our neighbors and coworkers might know salvation and one day praise God. Friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family, our community, our state, our world need us as individuals, us as the local church, us as the universal church to stop sitting in our blessings and get up and proclaim the hope of Jesus to the world. So what do we do? I think it's really easy to hear these stats and become overwhelmed and think, well, there's nothing I can do about that. But for the sake of our community and our world, that can't be our response. So what do we do? First thing we got to do is we have to know who God is and we have to love him. In this passage, we see, we see who God is. First, we see that he is, a, he is a gracious savior. Church, we have good news. We have life-giving news to proclaim to our neighbors and to the nations. We don't carry a message of condemnation, but a message of hope. A message that says God loves you. He is gracious. He is merciful. And he has sent his son to save you from your sin. We say to the, the peoples living in darkness, we, we say first, well, the, the, the light of God shines upon you. Turn from yourself, trust in him, and be saved forever. The next thing we see about God is in verse 4. Our, our, the NIV translated, he guides, but most translations uh, translated, he judges the people with equity. And this is sobering news for those that don't know Jesus. Because God, is a righteous, as a righteous God, must judge sin. He can't be in the presence of it. And so what that means is for every neighbor, every coworker, every family member, every person on earth that doesn't know and trust in Jesus, they will spend their eternity when they die separated from him in a place the Bible calls hell. You have been blessed, not so you can happily live out your life here on earth and then to spend eternity with God. You have been blessed to proclaim the good news of salvation to the world. I think about it this way. Consider if we were the neighbor that had never heard. The Afghani that had never heard. The Russian that had never heard. The Turk that had never heard. You fill in the people. Imagine that you were the one that had never heard the hope of Jesus. Wouldn't you want somebody to do whatever it took to come and tell you the good news of a holy God that loves you and has made a way for you to be saved? If you were that person, you would want everybody possible coming and proclaiming that hope until you believed. God loves the world. God desires for the world to know him and experience his salvation. And you and I are the chosen vessel to proclaim that good news to them. There is nothing special about us other than God chose to reveal his hope and salvation to us. He has blessed us lavishly, not because we are special or unique, but because he is good. And he desires for us to share that good news with our friends, with our neighbors, our community, and the nations of the world. 
God has blessed you not for your personal enjoyment, but so that you might proclaim that good news to the world. Platt writes again, What if our joy in God will increase not when we hoard God's blessings for ourselves, but when we spread God's blessings among others? He continues, I know few greater joys in leading people to life in Jesus. Greater than all the comforts of this world is the satisfaction of seeing more and more men and women glad in God. He says that is worth living for. God has designed our hearts to be glad in giving, not in hoarding. He says, yet you and I in this culture find ourselves swimming in an ocean of deceit. We're surrounded by lies that say, get, get, and get, and you'll be happy. He says, it's not true. God loves you, and in his love, God says, give your life away that you and others might be glad in me. So what's the action? What is the the practical calling on our lives? First, we must be a people of prayer. We're going to take some time and pray at the end of the the message, but this must become the heartbeat of our prayer life. If we want to be captivated by the purpose, then we must pray. And we can pray this psalm over our lives, over our kids' lives, over our church, over our fellow believers. We pray over our lives, God, God, would you bless us not to keep us safe and happy, but would you bless us so that your name is proclaimed in Green River, so that your name is proclaimed in Wyoming, so that your name is proclaimed to the nations. God, I pray you would bless me, bless my family, so that we might be used for your name's sake among my known world and among the nations. And then pray for your friends that don't know Jesus. Pray for your family members that don't know Jesus. Pray for for Mike, our friend in London that we support as he reaches out to the unreached people groups in London. Sign up at the Joshua Project for, for daily emails of unreached people groups that you can be praying for. Pray that God would bless, but that we wouldn't grow satisfied but instead would bless, pass that blessing on to others so that they might know salvation and praise God. And then we must let God's purpose captivate and change the way we live our lives. God has given us so much in terms of the gospel and in terms of our lives and our resources. He has given us everything we have as his people for one purpose so that we might make his name known among all peoples. We are blessed to be a blessing to others, to proclaim the hope of Jesus. That must captivate our lives and lead to action. For example, when that purpose captivates your life, it changes the way you view your job. Your job is no longer just a place you go to earn a paycheck, but your job is God's avenue of blessing, and it is your opportunity to bless and point others to the salvation and hope of Jesus. For example, the school year started this past Wednesday. We have many teachers and administrators and support staff and coaches and people in the schools in our church. When the purpose captivates the way you live your life, your job is not just a way to earn a paycheck, but it becomes your platform to bless. You begin to see the people you work with and the students in your class not as a burden, but as people loved by God that desperately need to hear the hope of salvation through Jesus. It becomes your calling to love them as Jesus loves them, to model for them forgiveness, mercy, grace, and God's love. For many of the students in your classroom and in your school, you may be the the closest Christian they know. God has blessed you so that you might bless those around you. Those of you in our schools have an incredible influence and opportunity to love and minister in our community. You get to be Jesus to kids who will probably never otherwise walk in a church building. The same is true if you work at the mines, the the bank, the the clinic, the grocery store, the McDonald's. God has blessed you and placed you where you are so that you might bless others and share the good news of the gospel with them. The principle changes the way you view your neighborhood and your community. God has placed you where you are with a purpose. The stats say 95% of your neighbors, 95% of our community does not know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. You are more than likely the closest Christian they know, and they need you to care for them, to bless them, to love them, to forgive them, to have compassion on them, and to share the good news with them. God has blessed you. He has chosen you so that those around you might know his salvation and praise him. One practical way to do this is start making a list of those around you that don't don't know Jesus. Pray for them regularly. Ask God for ways and opportunities to share the gospel to them. Then find ways to serve and love them. Pick up after people. Take care of a physical need. Listen to people when they need someone to talk to. Help them with a task no one else wants to do. 
When you see a way to show Jesus, do it. I love 1 Corinthians 9, 22, where Paul says, I have become all, sa- all things so that by all possible means some might know the salvation available in Jesus. Can we say that? Have we given of ourselves, given of our blessings, given of our comforts, so that by all possible means some might know Jesus? When the purpose captivates our lives, it changes the way we live. And then it changes the way we view our physical and material blessings. Our blessings, our paychecks, our stuff is not just intended for our glory and our comfort, but is intended to be used and to be leveraged to by us to bless others so that they might know Jesus. What's the action? Well, for some of you, this might mean that you need to get yourself out of debt so that you can be a blessing to others. You've got to get a handle on your finances. If you want to do that, there are resources to help. Come and talk with me and I'll connect you with someone to help you make a plan to do that. For some, this might mean you need to begin to take steps toward a biblical tithe of 10% toward the local church to advance the church's efforts to reach Green River and the world. We as a church send over 10% of every dollar that comes into the state and national and global mission efforts. That means every time you give to the church, you're supporting sending the gospel to the world. For some of you, you have been faithful with your finance. You've been faithful to tithe, but God is calling you to more. For you, that might mean a call to give more locally. It might mean a call to give towards global missions. It might mean a call to sell off a luxury and give towards the mission of seeing unreached people groups reached. The purpose must change the way we live, and it must change the way we handle and use our blessings. Then finally, this call, this purpose has to affect the way we make those big decisions in our life that come maybe every once or every, once or every few years. Big purchases, where to go to school. Who to marry? We better make sure they are aligned with us. To take the job, not take the job. To move, to not move. All must be processed through the lens of blessed to be a blessing. They all must be processed through the lens that we have been saved, we have been blessed, so that we can share the hope of salvation of of Jesus with those that don't know him. I know for our family that this has been a, a major factor in our big decisions. It's the lens that we try to filter those decisions through foremost. And often what has been easiest, what has been most comfortable, and even at times what on the surface might seem best for our family has not been what God has led us to. What he has called us to, as he called us to be a blessing to others, as he called us to be and give to those areas that are most lost. When faced with a a decision, think first which decision here brings the most glory to God and will help the most people know Jesus. And when God reveals that answer, trust him with the details. We are blessed abundantly, not for our comfort and ease, but so that we can bless others and lead them to the hope of salvation in Jesus. May we be a people and become a people that live for this purpose and not the purposes of the world. May our community be blessed and may the nations be blessed as we pass our abundant blessings on to others. We are a blessed people. And so this week I want to encourage you to pause and remember the blessings in your life. Give thanks to the Lord for those blessings and ask him how he would like you to use those for his glory. Make a list of the things the Lord has blessed you with and then ask him to show you how you can use those to spread the gospel. Maybe for you it's something the Lord has made you good at. And you need to use that to bless our community instead of just your family. Maybe the Lord has given you a financial blessing that you need to share. Maybe the Lord has given you the gift of of singlehood and time and you need to use that for others and not just yourself. Maybe the Lord has given you a talent that you need to use to serve those around you. What has the Lord given you that you need to share with those around you? When our lives end, we don't want to stand before the Lord and say, I had a very safe and comfortable and easy life. We want to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, this is what you gave me and this is what I did with it. And we want to look around and see all of these people that are there because of the sacrifices we made. And lastly, if you're here today or you're watching online and you are not a follower of Jesus, we would be remiss to miss the opportunity to share with you the greatest blessing available. The Bible tells us our sin, those things that we do that go against God, separate us from God, and the wage or the consequence of those sins is death and eternal separation from God. That's what our sin deserves. 
But because God so loves us, because he so loves you, he sends Jesus to die the death your sin deserves. And he, and he rises victorious over death, offering you forgiveness of sin, new life, and eternity in heaven with him. But you must believe. You must turn from your sin, and you must make him Lord of your life. The Bible says if you do that, he is faithful to forgive you and make you his own. So if you've never trusted him, would you do that today? Would you inherit the greatest blessing available to you? Or if you have questions or need to talk with someone, I would love to talk with you after we are done. So as we wrap up, the, the last thing that I, I want to do is I want to just give us some time to, to pray, kind of for those three areas. And so what I ask you to do is by yourself, just bow your head, or if you want to pray with your family or your spouse or a friend, you can do that. But I want to give you just a couple minutes to pray for these different areas uh, that we've talked about. And so the first thing I want to encourage you to pray for is just to pray for your friends, pray for your neighbors, pray for your coworkers. I would encourage you, maybe not right now, but as you go, to, to make a list of the names of those you know, that, those that you spend your days with, those that you love that don't know Jesus. Write those names down and intentionally pray for them. Pray for them now and pray for them moving forward. Pray for them by name and pray for opportunities to bless them, to serve them with the love of Jesus and share the hope of Jesus with them. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes. I just want you to, to bow your head and I want you to pray for your friends, for your neighbors, for your family members, for your coworkers that don't know Jesus. And I want you just to pray for our city and our, our county and our state. I looked it up again this week, but the statistics we got when we moved here was less than 5% of this city is practicing evangelical who put their faith in Jesus. So pray that God would move and draw many to saving faith in him and that he would allow us and that he would allow the, the other churches in our community through our sacrifice to be the conduit by which they hear and are saved. Pray that God would raise up leaders and that he would send people and leaders to help reach this community with the gospel. So pray for our city, for our county, and for our state. And lastly, would you pray for the nations? If there's a nation or a people that God has put on your heart, would you pray for them today? I think for many of us, the, the Afghanis are on our hearts and minds. Take some time to pray for them. Pray for their courage, protection, and pray that the gospel would spread. Pray for the, the thousands, the, the 6,000 plus unreached people groups, that God would use us, the blessed, to give and to be sent to take the good news to them. Give thanks for Revelation 7 that God says one day there will be peoples from every nation, every tongue, every tribe. Give thanks for that promise. And ask him to reveal to you and to us how we can be involved 
and taking his hope to the nations. we finish, I'm going to pray Psalm 67 over us, and I do. The worship team, they're going to come and lead us in a final song. But Lord, we, we thank you for this psalm. We thank you for the promises of the scripture. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the salvation and life we have in you. God, we thank, we thank you that we are blessed to have heard that message. We thank you that we are, are blessed with the, the opportunity to respond. We thank you that for many of us, we have experienced salvation and life in you. God, and we pray that you would continue to bless us. That you would help us to know you and love you more. That you would continue to bless us, but that you wouldn't bless us so that, that we might become more comfortable or live easier lives, Lord, but you would bless us so that we might bless others and share your salvation with the world around us. God, I pray that you would protect us from the lies of this world that lead us to, to disconnect your blessings from your purpose. God, would you move in our lives and captivate our lives with who you are and with your purpose of making you known so that everything we do, the way we live, the way we work, the way we recreate, the way we use our resources, that everything we do would be filtered through the lens of your purpose. That we would give our lives away so that others might experience life in you. So they might be glad in you. So they might rejoice in you. God, and we pray that as we are faithful to do that, that you will move and you will save as only you can do. That you would save people in Green River, that you would save people in Sweetwater County, that you would save people in Wyoming, that you would save people, that you would save the nations. God, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds where we need to change and we'd be faithful to do so. God, we thank you that you give us a purpose and a mission that is so much bigger than ourselves. We thank you that you choose to use us to spread your name's sake. God, we pray that we'd be faithful to do so. God, we thank you for your blessings, and we pray for more of them so that we might pass those on for your name's sake. Lord, we love you. We praise you, and it's your name we pray. Amen.